DAX Machina. Join us as we explore the mysteries of this world. Cryptids, monsters, macabre tales, and horror stories abound. Could they be true? Are monsters real? Good evening, folks, and thank you for joining us on another edition of DAX Machina. we got a full house tonight. Joining me is Robbie Rip Rain, Steve Wildman Monrotus, and Miss Naoma Finn, Storyteller. Folks, how y'all doing tonight? Fantastic. Couldn't be better. How you doing, Gars and Goyles? <laughs> Never had this much fun with my pants on. That's that's the night we're having. You have pants on? <laughs> you weren't supposed to bring it up. Well, one of us has to wear pants, the rest of us. On hey. the other hand. You know... The, the older you get, the less you care. There's a benefit to being filmed from the chest up, I suppose. <laughs> yep. Hey, it worked for our local weatherman. <laughs> yeah. My experience yep. is the less you get, the less you care. But, but that's me. <sighs> anyway. How y'all been? <clears throat> Alive. Well, fighting the crud, we all sound like anyway. Well, one version or another of the crud. Yeah, I think we're. If I'm, Rachel and I were talking about this the other day, we're. We've had first winter, full spring, second winter, snowsies, extra spring, and we're back heading towards that. that what are the next? It's kind of like the hobbits, but only with seasons instead of meals. I was meals. just, I was just sure. thinking this sounds just like uh, the uh, meal lineup in the Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. We were sitting at Jimmy's Egg the other day, and she rattled through it, and she had like 11 of them she came up with on the spot, just all, alternating between spring and winter. I'm like, yep, that sounds about right. Yeah. Missouri's weather is kind of bipolar. Gotta, yeah. Needs to be on more meds than I do, I think. Well, it's certainly off of them. Ugh. Oof. I, um... I was going to say something completely forgot what it was. Um, just kind of, I'm, I'm kind of astounded to have this many people. It's usually it's just me and Robbie here lately. Occasionally Noah popping in. Yeah. I like the way he pops in, makes a statement, and pops out. Oh yeah. <laughs> you should like do a little when he does, when he pops in. <laughs> Might be a great like sound that. effect to have. Like one Star Trek is a. Is a <laughs> Somebody's oh, so perfect. Somebody needs to pull a cork to see if Doc will pop in. Oh, I can try. I got one. Wait. <laughs> oh, I guess it didn't nope. work tonight. No, but I did see that genie jump out. <laughs> hey, I, for a minute there, DA got a little blurry. I was waiting for him to disapp right over here. <laughs> if it was With a glass in my uh, hand. I was going to say, if it was a, uh, a bottle of your favorite, you'd popped right in. <laughs> Anyway. It's like a, quite a few people are commiserating with our, our weather misery. Said it's happening in Kentucky as well. Robbie said it was happening out in in, uh, in South Crackalacky. The weather's just been nuts lately. Like it can't make its mind up. Oh, Cooter Transport looks like they're fixing to go through hell up there. Seattle's expected to get two to three feet of snow between Sunday and Monday. He has to chain up a 90,000 pound truck and trailer to go to work. Holy crap. 
That's a snow, snow blade on the front of it. No kidding. Hmm. Isn't, that a, nah. isn't that where Doc nah. was last last I heard? He was out in Seattle? Yep. That's where hmm. he landed the other day. Well, yeah, hopefully he's back there. home by now. Two to three feet of snow, that's going to cover him. He's going to see the level of snow in this hat making its way across the snow surface. <laughs> I was just thinking he was going to have a little flag strapped to him, kind of like the four wheelers do. <laughs> <laughs> like R2 and Dagobah's Marsh. <laughs> yeah. Doc, that way. Have send out a, have to send out a St. Bernard with a barrel full of rum on its neck for him. There you go. Poor guy hasn't got a snowmobile. The skinwalker ran off with it. Wendigo. Wendigo. Wendigo, that's right. Can he be okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bugs Bunny tunneling just hope he doesn't take a wrong turn at Albuquerque. <laughs> hey Martha, how you doing? <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yep. Uh just an old fart says uh Davenport, Iowa has been weird here too. Sixties one day, twenties the next. It's this it's a crazy weather, man. I mean I don't know what's going on, but, uh, you know, I sure wish it would make up its mind. I don't mind cold weather, and I don't mind warm weather. I just wish it would pick one. I, I just don't like them in the same day. <laughs> that's yeah. my complaint. You know, I went to work one day. You know, of course, I worked at 7, 7 at night to 7 in the morning. And I was driving to work like 6.30, and it was 59 degrees. And, you know, sun was starting to go down. It looked great. I left in the morning. It was 16. In 12 hours, it dropped that low. And, of course... I was wearing my scrubs and no jacket because it was 59 degrees when I came in and I'm too dumb to watch the weather. Well, see, that it, it was the exact opposite for me, Steve. I went into work. It was 22 degrees. So I'm bundled up. And by the time I get in my car that afternoon to go home, it's like 66. Yeah. <laughs> You're sweating under your armor. <laughs> <laughs> my husband spent the winter in the quad cities which is part of davenport iowa or davenport iowa is a part of and uh i went up there briefly when his father passed away for the funeral and then i came back and no snow on the ground i got back and and uh within a day they had 17 inches <laughs> oh, and, and i may i called him up and laughed at him every day <laughs> just Ass. i don't like snow I don't mind snow. I just uh, I don't like driving in it. As around here, it seems like anytime we get more of the two snowflakes in the air, everyone in the town learns forgets how to drive. Oh yes, yeah. this apocalypse. And then, of course, you know you've got you know every grocery store in town's being flooded with people buying eggs, milk, and bread. Like I don't know why. Like people, we're getting a quarter inch. You don't <laughs> freak out. It's not the snow apocalypse. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why a friend of mine who's absolutely lactose intolerant. Bought two gallons of milk when we had the last storm. I'm hmm. like, do you even cook with milk? Very, very <laughs> little. You know, gives me the craps. I'm like, you've got two gallons. It's good for like a week. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't pretend to understand it. <laughs> I don't pretend to understand much. When I do, I get called out on it. Yeah. Well, so what do you folks think about tonight's topic, gargoyles? Well, it's one of my favorites, which is why I'm here. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a fascinating topic that, I've, that I, I thought I was okay with, but I'm pretty sure from knowing you buggers, by the time I get off this little <laughs> meeting, I'll be scared shitless. So appreciate you. It's what I find answer. interesting is the recent spate of them in Puerto Rico. Oh, yeah. Been a whole gaggle of sightings in Puerto Rico in the last few years. Yeah. I don't know if chupacabras really... sprouted wings or if it's a legit <laughs> gargoyle. Or, or that or chupacabras like, okay, no, I'm done. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm out. Yeah. It's well, all yours, buddy. Do you want to start us out a little bit? I know you're. Uh, it's one of your favorite subjects. You want to tell us a little bit about the origin of gargoyles and we'll kind of just jump in from there? Well, um, of course, gargoyles, a true gargoyle um, by virtue of its name is from, I believe the French, it comes from an old French word, which really means gurgling water. And so a true gargoyle is something that sits on a building and it has a spout. If it doesn't have a spout, then it's a grotesque. And, hmm. um, but of course, throughout history, 
there have been uh, incidents of gargoyles that didn't sit on the building and weren't made of stone, or if they were, they were still moving. And those have, gargoyles historically are supposed to be protectors. They're, you know, they look horrible, but they're meant to be protectors. But over time, they have come to be known as, as demonic in nature. And even uh, a lot of gargoyles, which take the features of what we think of as demons, are really, that's the other way around, demons having taken the, the features of what we see as gargoyles. So, and of course, my all-time favorite gargoyle story is the one in Houston at uh, Johnson. An engineer from NASA? Yes, I love that story. Now, there's some question as to whether or not, um, the story actually comes from his daughter. And these days, if you call, of course, it's the government, you call them up and you ask them about it. They're like, no, we never heard of it. Don't know what you're talking about. But at the time, uh, when Frank Shaw had his encounter, um, it took him a few days before he finally got up the courage and, and walk, walk into work and say, you know, uh, there was this thing outside and the person that he spoke to said, oh yeah, come with me. And they had an entire file on him. A lot of people had seen them. So, but that is actually my all time favorite gargoyle story is the guys leaving work at Johnson Air Force Johnson Space Center and he happens to it's late at night he happens to look up and there's a gargoyle glaring down at him man that'll do it for you you know that would have been pretty serious pucker factor but when they told him yeah you're not the first one to report that I bet that at that moment he was considering a career change yeah <laughs> at the very least uh you know a, a change to a different facility in a different state or country I like the description of it. The description almost sounds like you know, the comic book descriptions of Batman. Well, you know, and like, that's oh, what's really Batman. interesting is because Frank Shaw actually had his encounter in the 1980s, but there is a legend in Houston, Texas, that goes back to the 1950s that they call the Batman legend. And okay. that began with a lady who happened to be sitting on her front porch. She's talking to her neighbor and, a, a, well, two neighbors. One was a young girl about 14. The other one was a 33-year-old man. They're just sitting there talking and having a nice evening. And they all, they see the shadow go across the yard. And they all, you know, what, what was that? And they happen to look up into a pecan tree across the road. And there is this gargoyle. <laughs> and there, and depending on what account you read, they're either, either it sat there and stared back at them until it just slowly dissipated and vanished before their eyes. Or my favorite version of the one I've found more often is that it sat there for a few minutes and then it took flight, went straight up in the air. And they said this thing was around seven feet tall and it was somewhere between really dark gray and utterly black, depending on the encounter. And um, that was, <laughs> that would be quite enough to make me say, yeah, I'm moving. I don't want to live in Houston anymore, but it wow. became known as the Batman legend. So there you go. I just think it, it's neat. I, I was thinking of the, uh, you know, some of the, the scenes you see in some of the Batman films where, you know, your typical, you know, Gotham City alleyway, some ne'er do wells are having some kind of an encounter and, you know, below him. And the camera pans up and Batman's, you know, crouched down, cape wrapped around him in the rain, you know, listening to their conversation with some kind of technology, you know. And, well, a lot of the a lot of the earlier artists that was that were drawing those, that they took inspiration from those. And if you'll even look at some of the some of the early comic books of Batman where he's sitting up on the building, a lot of times he's sitting next to a a gargoyle. Yeah, they, well, sense. interestingly, I mean, Bob Kane's version of of uh, Batman didn't even look anything like that. It, he was, but um, I think Bill Finger helped move it into that gargoyle-like appearance. And of course, Frank Miller definitely brought it there. But oh yeah, but if you think about Batman's. Um like the, the whole ethos of it, it's not that different than an actual gargoyle, you know? Yeah. He, I he's mean, protector of some people, but he's not a good guy. And, you know, those who 
who don't want to encounter him. He's a demon. <laughs> <You know? Right. laughs> and he doesn't even need a gun. He doesn't need a gun. In the early Bob Kane uh, comics, he did carry a gun. Well, yeah, and then the awesome. original. My least yeah. favorite Batman is the the old Batman serial that used to play in the 1940s. And, oh, that's awful. Oh, that's it. Lewis, I think, was the name of the guy that, that played him. But um, he always had a gun in those in the serial. He always carried a gun then. Well, the, the original Batman um, com, uh, comic, he, was, he shot people. Yeah. yeah. And to me, the best version of Batman is always going to be Darkwing Duck. Yes. <laughs> 100%. Uh, I love Darkwing Duck. That was such a great cartoon. A friend of mine yeah, wrote Darkwing Duck. Dangerous. I was all prepared to spite you for Adam West, but hey, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I love Adam West. Uh, you know, it, I was thinking if you're going to take any DC superhero and go to full on camp with it, yeah, let's use the Dark Knight. Why not? <laughs> yeah. I, um, a friend of mine actually wrote Darkwing Duck. He actually won an, an, Emmy, an Emmy Award for it. That's awesome. Good I, tell, him I, tell him I loved his work. <laughs> I mean, he was one of the writers on the staff, but sure. he, he did become head writer on the um, Penguins of Madagascar series. Not Smile the... and wave, boys. Smile, <laughs> Smile and wave. And wave. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, somebody commented on the Gargoyles uh, animated series. You know, I love that series, also known as Star Trek: The Next Next Generation. <laughs> yeah, because they, they had so many of the cast members doing voices. I know they yeah. at least had at some point Jonathan Frakes, Marina Sirtis, and Michael Dorn. I think there were others. Michael Dorn did Goliath, I think, right? The main. No, I think that was uh, uh, Keith David. Yep, Keith what? David. I couldn't think of his name, yeah. but but yeah, oh. Keith David, uh, the the wonderful Keith David. Oh, Keith David's fantastic. Uh, speaking of uh, of gargoyles, though, any of you see that old campy gargoyles movie from the seventies? Mm -hmm. Yep. I lived in New Mexico at the time camp. when I that I saw that, and whenever we'd be driving through the desert at night, I would just have this almost panic attack, thinking this thing was going to come running up out of the desert and sprinting next to the car. It's yeah. you know, oh, I love that story too. There is an actual encounter in California. Of a family that that said that they were going down the highway, the coast highway, coastal, whatever it is, in California, and they were in a station wagon, and they were attacked. Um, th they weren't attacked. It followed them. It tapped the roof of the car a few times, and eventually it flew off. But um, I always think of that movie when I think of that story because yeah, similarities. I remember hearing that that encounter. Um, mm -hmm. their, their encounter stories and, and legends of gargoyle type creatures pretty much from all over the planet. <laughs> um, just really bizarre stuff. The Japanese have something very similar, although I, I wouldn't even want to try to pronounce it. Um, but the, you know, the Japanese version of the gargoyle is a little more sinister than ours. It's, it, it hunts people. It's kind of, uh, kind of a nocturnal, just predator. Uh, mm. and then, you know, of course, you know, you've got other, other legends of, of similar type creatures, but. But going know, back it's, to, it's, it's, uh, sorry, I thought you finished. I was just gonna say, going back to Naomi's original uh, uh, origin of them being protectors, the movie I Frankenstein, you know, it actually mm -hmm. had gargles in it, but that that they actually portrayed them as what they what they were supposed to be, that they were an order ordained by God to protect humans from demons, and they fought the demons. So I mean, that, that's that's kind of cool. I think that they actually did a little bit of research and made it yeah. more historical, you know, cause they, they looked like humans when it was nighttime, but when it come daytime come around, they went back to their perch, turned to stone and they were gargoyles throughout the day. Interestingly, could Mothman have been a gargoyle? It's interesting that, that you asked that. And the reason for it is because when Mothman occurred, people in Houston were like, yeah, we got those. They're called gargoyles. <laughs> <laughs> and so and they did they, they, that, they're bigger yeah <laughs> they, they were insistent that what the mothman was was a gargoyle because of the batman um legend mm -hmm. that was going on in legend. houston at the time yeah so and that, and there was a me, bit it, of a it kind of makes sense i mean yeah 
Could it be a gargoyle? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, you'd be a people that only get, you know, get like not really good lit up views of something. I could see how they describe a gargoyle as looking like a big moth. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Another, I hate when I say interestingly, I start that so, so many sentences with that. Stop me. <laughs> anyway, there was, uh, you know, the, the La Llorona story in Mexico. Mm -hmm. She was a woman who, uh, apparently killed her children and then was doomed to a life of uh, eternity of misery. And she comes and steals, I don't know if she steals children or whatever the La Llorona story is. But every now and then you'll get a video out of Mexico that has something weird flying across the sky and it looks like a witch. And of course people automatically call it La Llorona. And, but when you look at them, you have to say, hmm, looks a little more gargoyle-ish to me. And I've noticed that people are starting to blend the La Llorona story into the gargoyle story because Mexico is a place where there are a lot of, of sightings of gargoyles. Right. Well, so. and, you know, there's, there's some argument that, you know, people could kind of manifest their fears and manifest things into existence, you know, mm -hmm. between the, the practitioners of Santeria and the, the, just the very devout Catholics, you know, demons are kind of on the, 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 the tip of everybody's tongue most of the time. Well, and you know, we've kind of talked about that before when we, we talk about dogman sightings where some people will say, you know, there were, like DA sighting, it was pretty much just an animal that was doing what an animal does. But then you hear other people talk about the red eyes and they use hellish, demonic. You know, my personal feeling is if a demon is going to appear to you, whatever your deepest, darkest fear is, I think it's going to tap into something like that. So when you see mm -hmm. things like that, yeah, that kind of resembles like just, and Naomi kind of hit on it earlier, demons taking forms that, so that doesn't necessarily mean that every gargoyle is demonic. Gargoyles could very well be what Naomi said of, as protectors, but demons could very well tap into that. If people were frightened of that, that form and that image, just like a dog man, you know, if you're scared right. of wolf. And you know what we know. So scripturally, a demon is a fallen angel. That's the difference between a demon and an angel. One is fallen. One, one followed Satan and one stayed in heaven and followed God. That is. And what we know from the Bible is that demons actually can not have any form, but they can inhabit anything. And you know, the, the demons that were cast out of the man and went into a, a um, big, yeah, but I can't think of what they call a. Uh, well, you don't what know you when Jesus cast. Pigs. Oh, oh, uh, oh! Uh, now, hang on. Uh, a sounder. Is it a sounder of hogs? Oh, I thought you were talking about the legion. Is what they no, what, no. what they called what the demon called it. Yeah, so. it was a legion of demons that went into a sounder of hogs, I believe. But like the but, but like the the plural of of hogs. Mm. Yeah, like it's a congress of apes. Right, a murder know. of crows, whatever. Right. I well, think it's the sounder of hogs. That was the word I was looking for. I'll see if I can figure it out. So, yeah, that's... But, um, so, I mean, a demon doesn't really have have a form. I mean, it, it could inhabit anything, which I wonder if it can inhabit stone and make the stone and animate it. Can it? If it well, can be able to, I mean, it's it would have powers beyond anything we would even be able to comprehend. So, so a group of so, pigs is it would also a make sense on why some people think like okay. like dolls have become possessed and come to life and things like that. Because if it can move something inanimate, inanimate, why couldn't it move just about anything inanimate? True, true. And you know, I could see a demon going along and getting to a building and seeing a grotesque and saying, man, you're hot. I need to get inside you. <laughs> I mean, you know. It could be interesting. It could be. So, our and, Anne Rice probably wrote a book about it if it had that kind of a slant. <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> so, I mean, that, I mean, that's just my opinion, but there is, I mean, there are places. It's 
Um, skipping to the last page of the notes I sent you guys, there, there's a church in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I wrote down the name of the church. It's in the notes somewhere. Can't remember yeah, what it's called. Walnut Street Baptist Church. That's the one. So there were two churches, and one was Walnut Street Baptist Church, and the other one was another church, and and they uh, combined and became one church. I think in 1815. And then years and years later, they actually, and they, they called themselves the Walnut Street Baptist Church, but they built this cathedral style building, this absolutely gorgeous big church. And it had um, gargoyles, I believe, on the spires. And, and I actually think there may be a, a grotesque um, somewhere along in there too that someone had erected later. But as early as the 1880s, there were people reporting that they would look up into the sky, you know, look up at this beautiful building and there would be a gargoyle flying around over it. Hmm. Now that's crazy to me. <laughs> you would think a church considering what it's used for would have some sort of protection if it's demonic. Well, there was so. also that, uh, that church in uh, the, the French quarter of new Orleans, where you know, I know the locals relate it to a vampire, but the the creature itself was described as being very bat-like, flying around that mon that uh that you know, it was a monastery. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a really interesting <laughs> looking church too. I've seen that one. So th there's there's sightings, you know, even today all over the place. Well, and it depends on on how you define holy ground too. You know, it, you may have been perfectly safe inside the church. You know, mm -hmm. it. it yeah, you know, it depends on how the building was sanctified as to, you know, what's actually holy of it. You know, is it everything inside the sidewalk? You know, is it, who knows? We believe in my religion, we believe that actually the, the building is just a building and the church is the people. So maybe, you know, if the church isn't actually resident inside the building at the time, maybe that's why. I don't know. I just still think in my mind, there should be some kind of protection <laughs> if it's that's what it's used for so um oh wow i had no idea uh what what josh dalton just said but Ancho, oh, that, wow. that sounds pretty interesting i'd like to hear about that i was thinking that any cathedral had to have some type of holy relic though oh does it i may be wrong but i, I was thinking that that was that was expected, but interesting. I don't know. I, I I'm far from the expert on on Catholicism. That's for sure. Yeah, I am. I don't know very much about it. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not Catholic, so I'm right there with well, you. I was raised Catholic, but really haven't had much experience in since my you know junior high. But uh, I did go uh, when I lived in the Philippines. Uh, there is a a very very old. Uh, church, uh, a Catholic church in, in Manila, it was built in 1516, and uh, they have a, uh, you know, like one of the requirements to to be a saint is you know a certain number of miracles are happen or whatever else. Well, this one particular, uh, I think it was a uh, like a he wasn't a priest, but he was more like the like the male equivalent of a nun. You know, he 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 was the next step down from a Friar? priest, whatever that is. A what? Prior, prior, maybe that's it. Well, when he died, he did decompose, and so they have his body, you know, basically it like self mummified, and it's they got it sitting in a glass case in there. It's like, okay, how the heck did somebody who lived in Manila in the 1500s not rot? You know, it's like 90 percent humidity there. But, yeah, uh, it's seen, not exactly uh, conducive to that. Yeah, I've seen his body, and you know, he, there was a big story about, you know, how that was kind of like the final thing he needed to be sanctified, and it's a beautiful church. Uh, they still do uh, Latin masses once a Sunday, and they'll do a uh, an English mass and then one in Tagalog, and wow. uh, I I went to the to the Latin and Tagalog masses because I've never heard a, mat, a Latin mass, and you know, Tagalog is kind of interesting to listen to also, so. Yeah, I figured they're all kind of the same, so I could follow it, knowing you basically in my head, knowing the subtitles in English, I could I could follow what was going on. It was really cool. Huh. That's beyond anything I've ever done. 
<laughs> not Catholic. Well, I, well, I wasn't at the time, but I, you know, I lived there for four months, and I figured, you know, what the heck? You know, like a dimmick stay. But I got an opportunity to, you know, tour a really old mosque. You know, I would do it, and I would learn what I could learn about it. You know. Oh yeah, true, absolutely. I'm just have never done that. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually kind of cool. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the subtitles in my head. Definitely, right. I'd be pretty lost there. So, well, yeah, if you don't know the catechism, and you'd have absolutely no idea what was going on. Yeah. So there's that. Um, I need to break away for just a second and send a quick message. Sure. So uh, I guess I've got a question for the group. So if we were to assume these gargoyles actually exist, which you know we. We, we always go to this with an open mind that they could. Did they start off as demons who then manifested or some kind of beings that manifested that into stone critters? Or did they start off as a statue that animated into the the other things? Well, the, 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 according to the French legend behind it, uh, the legend sprang up around St. Romanus, um, who's the former chancellor of the Merovingian king Clotaire II, who, who, made bishop of, who was made bishop of Rouen. Uh, relates how he delivered a, a country and a, around Rowan, R O U E N, from a monster called the Gargoyle, G R G A R G O U I L L E, or the Goji. Uh, it's uh, it's said to have been a typical dragon with bat-like wings, a long neck, and the ability to breathe fire. Multiple versions of the story are given that either Saint Romanus subdued the creature with a crucifix, or he captured the creature with the help of a, of, of the only volunteer, a condemned man. In each, in each, though, the monster is led back to Rowan and burned, but its head and neck would not burn due to it being tempered by its own fire breath. The head was then mounted on the walls of the newly built church to scare off evil, evil spirits and used for protection. So in commemoration of, of St. Romain, the archbishops of Rowan were granted the right to set a prisoner free on that day that the reliquary of the saint was carried in procession. Hmm. Interesting. On well, the Merovingians, they were an interesting, interesting group. Very true. We could do a whole show on that very easily. and We probably will at some point. Yeah, that's cool. That is really cool. But allegedly, that's the origin of the gargoyle in France. Yeah. Uh, the Church of Rome. Hmm. Interesting. I'm wondering if you might be onto it, though, if, uh, if they're, they're not carved and then life is given to them. Well, that's kind of what I was thinking. It was like, a, especially if they're meant to be protectors of the church and of humanity. Right. They're, they're, the Japanese have something like that, and I think they're called a hinewa. I, I may be wrong on that, uh, but they they are basically like clay statues that are uh, carved to. Uh, they're put in like around tombs of of people, and mm -hmm. then though they animate to. Uh, you know, basically protect the body of the of the deceased and and to to keep the the, the sanctity of the of the building, kind of like the terracotta soldiers, you know, and the the, the Chinese the Chinese emperor. Uh, but yeah, the Hinua. Uh, if you ever played the Legend of Zelda, the Reed Deads are based on a Hinua story. Uh, a three D has a golem. That's that's what that what anything any inanimate object that is animated and comes alive. You can have lava golems and stone golems and nature golems and yeah, interesting. That's really cool. Fascinating. Though. I like it. By the way, um, the gargoyle in in Louisville, although it's never caused any real harm to anyone, has been known to scratch and poke people. That was a lot of that at, uh, in the uh, the accounts that are coming out of Puerto Rico, people hearing them walk on the roofs of their of their house or scratching at windows and, and on the on the the uh, tiles. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm a moderator on another show for a friend of mine, and I didn't realize he was having a show tonight until it popped oh, up no. on my screen. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> I won't be there. <laughs> Sorry. He just sent me a message saying, yeah, I see where I stand. Yep, behind EA. 
<laughs> so, my bad. That's funny. Yeah, yeah I he, stand behind him unless we're being attacked by a dog man, and then I'm running in front of him. <laughs> yeah, you guys, all you have to do is take me with you if you're going to go dog man hunting. I can't run at all. It'll definitely stop with me. <laughs> you can all outrun me. We'll just have to make sure we bring plenty of sweet baby rays. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll just coat myself in it for you. <laughs> or chocolate at it. There you go. I am kind of funny. Tip all of your uh, your weapons with Hershey's kisses and shoot them and see see <laughs> see if it works like some kind of rune. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm so sweet. If Dog Man eats me, he's going to end up with diabetes anyway. It's the reason they don't attack me. <laughs> They're afraid it's contagious. <laughs> you're gonna hear a dog man out in the if it, if it gets me, you're gonna hear a dog man out in the woods going. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just take a few more diuretics. He'll have to yeah. be on everything along the way, and you can get out. his territory everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> like the two. <laughs> The old joke about the two uh, missionaries sitting in the stew pot in the cannibal village. And the one missionary starts laughing hysterically, and the other one says, "I don't see what you think is so funny." And the other, the first one said, "Well, they're going to eat us, but they're sure not going to like the gravy." <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's <that's> terrible! <laughs> oh my yeah. God. <clears throat> And that joke is old enough that I found it in a book when I was a kid, and the book was old then. Huh. So, yeah. Open Culling Books says, uh, the gargoyles with the open mouth are the giant eaters, aren't they? I, I miss Naoma. I'll defer to your, your better knowledge on that. I actually, I, I don't know. The ones with the open mouths usually have water coming out of them when it rains. Um, that's where the spout usually goes to through the mouth. And um, so I don't know. I, as much as I, I find the topic interesting and I love collecting stories about them, I don't know as much about the background of them as I probably should. It just fascinates me. Uh, much like those giant spider stories, which terrify me in Texas and Mexico of the spiders that are the size yeah, I'm not of, a fan of fan of spiders and Louisiana um, at um, what's Fort Polk called now? Fort. Uh, oh, I don't be, know. Yeah. It used to be Fort Polk, but um, those, those stories fascinate me. I, I love to hear them, but I don't, uh, you know, I, I, the one about the family that was chased down on the highway and the, uh, my, my favorite one is always going to be the Johnson Space Center one. Oh, yeah. And, well, um, and, and true to your background, I mean, you're, you're a storyteller and a historian, you're or a storyteller, yeah. you know, a bard, perhaps. Uh, you're not a cryptozoologist, you know. No, I'm not. That's true. I'm, I'm not. My research is not my strong suit. Uh, gathering stories is what I do best. And I really do. Um, ooh, really big bugs in Texas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have really big, ginormous cockroaches at the government uh, facility I used to work at. Like yeah. that, like Madagascar type co cockroaches. Yeah. They have some in the Philippines that are like that. And they fly. Yeah. yeah that's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> That horrifying uh, moment when you realize cockroaches can fly. That ain't right. Well, in my particular case, we were all sitting outside a, a Starbucks there because we worked you know, we worked overnights there because we you know, there are 14 hours time difference. And so I had a day job back in the States, so I worked overnights there. Well, we're at the Starbucks and we're all you know, having coffee and smoking cigarettes and everything. And this roach starts crawling up towards, you know, the group of us. And a couple of the women that I were with were just completely having kittens over it. And so I thought I'd be the gentleman and I would you know, dispatch this, this roach with extreme prejudice. And I get about six feet from it and it flies at my face. <laughs> and I screamed about five octaves than I thought I could and ran <laughs> very embarrassingly away as I'm batting it out of my hair. <laughs> and um, yeah, 
So, Sorry. Air, every milligram of testosterone left my body at that moment. <laughs> Just with all my self-respect. Oh, uh, heck. Oh, well, it was, it was not a proud moment. <laughs> Any well, kind was, of a spider uh, will have that effect on me. I'll curl up into a ball, suck my thumb, and the last thing I'll say before I go into that, that little curled up mode is, spider, <laughs> come well, on. You know, I don't have a fear of spiders, but I just learned recently that, that tarantulas actually make noises. Like, they can actually, like, purr. No, 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 no. And no, I no, was no. like, oh, no, now they're even more terrifying. Oh, God. I can't stand that thought. I don't no. want to think about it talking to me before it sucks all the fluids out of my body. <laughs> I'm going to eat you now. <laughs> no. <laughs> I just assumed they were mute. Of course, I thought I didn't know the deer could make noise either until I heard one, you know, yeah. running away in fear. I, I just assumed they were mute. Yeah. A lot of animals that can make noises you wouldn't expect. I can remember the first time I heard a rabbit call. <laughs> it's oh like, God, yes. a what? <laughs> yeah, that, that was a new one for me too. And yeah. I, I was still pretty much, I was still pretty young. And I was thinking when they said rabbit call that it was going to go, you know, what's up, doc? Well, <laughs> and it didn't. <laughs> I learned, it was, I guess it was yesterday or the day before, that ravens can mimic human speech. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like a like a parrot. And I was like, oh, my Lord. And, I, and I, the, this gal who was an ornithologist or something at the, at the zoo was demonstrating all the different things that this raven could speak. And it had, it would like mimic the actual voices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like it said, hello, in a, like a fairly deep voice. And then it, it, it kept saying, hi. And, it, but it sounded like you'd expect like your, your stereotype, like New York Jew, you know, that kind of, you know, yeah. that, that your Dennis Wolfberg kind of voice. And I was like, that is just bizarre. <laughs> you know, we had a, had a crow over here that would, uh, would uh, bring me money for treats. And uh, he would, he started with coins and I thought it was really cool that he walked up with a coin. And so I, my wife had some pecans that she was going to be cooking with. And I you know, gave him one of the pecans. I tossed it on the ground. He ate it and took off. And then I guess either he couldn't find money or whatever, but like he's bringing me bottle caps and random things. And I'm like, I thought it was cool. And yeah. uh, you know, he, he had observed a human dude at some point. If but, you uh, give crows, if you feed them regularly or you gift them, they will gift you back. Oh, it's cool. They are, yeah. I mean, um, I got a I got a Bud Light bottle cap for a cheese it, and you know, just it, there's it a really great me. story about a lady who um, she kept. One day, she mentioned she was single mom. Her son was about 14 years old, and she happened to mention to her son, "Have you ever noticed how many crows there are in our backyard?" And he kind of giggled and he said, "Yeah, mom, I've been putting stuff out for him, bread and corn and stuff." And they never thought anything more of it. And her the mom thought, well, I guess, you know, you could have worse habits. Well, she was a professional photographer and she had gone out into the woods and was doing some nature photography. And she got home and she realized that she had lost the lens cap on one of her favorite lenses. And the next day, the lens cap wound up on her back porch. The crows oh, brought it awesome. to her. Is that not the coolest story? I that love that really story. Neat. I love that. Yeah, as long as it was the crows and not Bigfoot, we're good. I know you got to be really <laughs> careful when you get rid of your cigarettes. Be sure to put them out because they love lit cigarettes. And uh, they'll they'll take them to uh, – the, the smoke helps keep the, the, the bugs off of them, the mites off of them. And inadvertently, they'll sometimes take them back to their nests yeah. and barns and things. And they'll set the things on fire. Um, oh, they, no. They like the you – know, they, they don't do it on purpose. They just – they like the cigarettes. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I flash back to um, the very racially degrading crows in Dumbo. <laughs> oh my lord, yes! <laughs> I can't help it. I it's bad. I know. I am But yeah, all I can think is I've been unseen were... about everything. <laughs> yeah, some of those cartoons were pretty questionable by today's, today's standards. Yeah, they were. <laughs> They're saying that our human contact with the crows is actually ruining their calls. Like, you know, people mimic the that sound, that 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 caw, you know, that uh, that the crows mm -hmm. make. 
Well, now crows in the Midwest, especially caw with a human accent. So it sounds like a, it's just something like they should. That sounds like a human being going caw. <laughs> they, say, like, they say y'all afterwards. Call y'all. Call y'all. <laughs> call. Oh. Call. Call. Y'all was hey, getting call. on it. <laughs> Crow's hanging out at what's that lady's name that cook that um oh god. Anyway, she always said hi y'all. Mini Pearl? No, she was a cook on Amber. Oh, Flo. Flo. No, she's a cook on um, the Food Network. Um, oh. She was a chef. I've never watched Food Network. I thought she. <laughs> no, she got in trouble because she wanted to put on an antebellum dinner and hire actors to be slaves and everything, and they took her off the air. Paula Dean, thank you. Oh. Well, she always said, Hey, y'all. And I could hear a crow going, Hey, you call. <laughs> she's got a restaurant down here in Branson, not too far from me. Does she really? Yeah. Never ate there, but uh, we've seen it every time we've gone down to the landing. Yeah. The I've tried some of her recipes. By itself. <laughs> yeah, I've tried some of her recipes. She's not, I mean, her food's some not. Of them, some of them are okay, but the nutritionally, they're horrible for you. Well, you yeah. Know, she... I mean, you know, it is possible to cook Southern or cook with a cast iron skillet. And not make something that is basically consists of an arterial plaque, you know. Yeah, you don't uh, have to cook everything with a pound of lard. Well, exactly. My wife is a very southern cook, and she has her cast iron skills, and she knows how to use them. But you know, I don't have a cholesterol of three thousand. Yeah, I'm a southern cook. I cook almost exclusively with cast iron skillets, and oh, they're the best. Most of my food is dangerous for your arteries. Well, I just figured that she's trying to get me to an early death, but that's okay. Uh, I'll die happy. <laughs> I'm not a great cook, but I I can get by. But anyway, I don't know. Uh, I'm still bugging about these these uh, these um, gargoyles. I'm I'm really trying to figure out what their where their place in the you know, their little niche in, in, in our culture is, you know, the dogmen, I kind of understand where they fit in. You know, I kind of understand where, you know, the Sasquatch critters fit in. I'm trying to figure out what purpose the gargoyles serve. You know, are they these protectors? If they're not, and they're some kind of a you know, demonic entity, what, what's their end game? Why, you know, what are they doing other than scaring the shit out of us? <laughs> you know, do they have a, a, a bigger plan, you know, or a bigger, you, bigger part of the ecosystem? Yeah. I, and yeah, no doubt. I need to interject here because I have a feeling that I'm going to get called out for something. Okay. Go um, for first it. of all, yeah, Moth, and anytime you guys want to come down, I'll make you fried chicken and chicken and noodles. You just have to let me know a day or two in advance. Um, and secondly, I saw something that somebody wrote. I think it may have been Penny about you knowing how to use cast iron with the lump on the head and before Mothin sees that I need to tell the story because I need to tell it correctly first of all my first husband and I had a very volatile relationship um, neither one of us was the good guy in that marriage and and I'm not going to de demonize him and I'm not going to try to deify myself it's just the way it was and we had some pretty wicked fights but the cast iron skillet that I have a feeling Mothin is going to bring up, I did not knock my ex-husband out with a cast iron skillet. It was an aluminum skillet that looked cast iron because it was black from years of use. So, but, and yeah, I did knock him out, but it wasn't on purpose. And so whatever he says in chat, ignore him. Go on, guys. <laughs> well. Rachel has three different sizes of the circular skillets, and then she has a, I guess you'd term it a griddle. It's like a like a flat square mm -hmm. skillet. Okay, I'm going to get my terminology right. Sorry, I was raised in St. Louis. <laughs> we, we don't use lard a whole lot. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, she makes some amazing stuff. I mean, part of the, part of the uh, 
the the wild hunt story the 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 rachel of that story is based on her actual cooking <laughs> yeah moth and the my, stone stories my mother had a whole set of cast iron that she cooked in and when she passed away it all went to my sisters i wish i could have gotten some of that old well-seasoned cast iron cookware but i'm gonna i'm gonna start collecting my own um i know how to cook in it i just at the moment don't have any yeah they're generational i mean yeah. seriously if you in take my, care of them they will last 100 years easy my favorite skillet was my great grandmother's and it went to my grandma and then to my mom and now it's mine and and i have no idea which of my two sons is going to get it because the one son doesn't cook chicken and the other i don't know i don't know who's going to get it but it's been in the family i'm the fourth one to have it now That's so cool. i mean i've got several cast iron skillets but and if you're going to collect them collect griswolds <laughs> Mouth and says me, me, me. Well, cast iron skillets, uh, you know, they're, they, they just don't, if you take care of them, they'll last forever. And, uh, you know, you just, just got to make sure you continue to take care of them. It's like any, any of these other things that were, you know, well built and quote unquote the day, you know? Yeah. Uh, Weber grills are another one. Uh, I have a little, uh, little Smoky Joe grill that my, my late grandmother got for me when I started college. And so I've had it now for, well, it'll be 30 years in September. And it gets better every time I use it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Now it's as it's as ugly as homemade soap, but you know, makes it's, yeah. it's wonderful, huh? It makes it good. It makes it mean better than anything. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And and for a little you know picnic grill, what we cooked for what four six of us? Six, that, the really. the day that uh, the first Wild Hunt book came out, yeah. and it easily did the job. Now the beer didn't last long enough, but the the uh... well, there's a mystery surrounding that Weber grill. There really is. Steve and I went down to the the little park area right below his apartment with a full case of <laughs> of, uh, of uh, uh, Guinness. I know the story. <laughs> and in about what the span of about forty five minutes that it took us to cook those cook those brats, somebody stole that case of Guinness. I mean, I I think I drank one. Oh, I might have uh -huh. had two. I used uh -huh. one on the brat, so maybe well, two. We went to take stuff back up, and every one of those beers were gone. Yeah, and tell them how you got pot. back up. <laughs> well, and the worst part about the whole thing is, I think we got poisoned because I wasn't walking near like I should have after I got <laughs> done with that. I fell and, asleep uh, on your on your porch. Now, like that case of Yingling flats that disappeared on us. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, well, that was a 15 pack of Yingling, and it lasted and about, about and about a case of actually Yingling, not the flights. <laughs> it lasted 20 minutes. I don't know where the yeah. thing went to. Oh my god! Yeah, whenever was... we're around, beer just disappears. I don't know where it's going. <laughs> yeah, oh, Lord. Steve I'm gonna Black. call your wives tomorrow, guys, and tell them you've been telling the story. Oh, my nose, my nose. Yeah. <laughs> she was oh, there. So... Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're I know. Right. That's how I know how you walked. <laughs> Well, the, I think the funniest part of that was uh, attempting to move my car the hundred yards or so from the. Not even the that. House. It was like, yeah, like 50, twenty feet. 20, 20 feet. Well, it was more than that. A few yards anyway. But the reason we we put it on the car because you know we had to walk a considerable distance and there was like the cooler, the the charcoal, the you know tools for the grill and all this other stuff and it was, you know, it was a, a trunk full of of stuff. It would have been multiple multiple trips walking up this fairly steep hill. And so we decided we had to move the car up there. I'm like, okay, well, we probably shouldn't, but it needs to be done. And uh, at that time, DA was active law enforcement. And I got down behind the wheel and I started the car and I started giggling. He's like, why are you laughing? And he goes, because I'm clearly under the influence sitting next to an active law enforcement officer getting ready to drive my car. <laughs> and, and he goes, I don't see anything. <laughs> and like, I put it in reverse. And I'm like, it's going so fast. <laughs> It was literally out of one space over the park across the parking lot to another space. Up a hill, it wasn't yeah. like we were driving through town. Right, yeah, we, we literally, yeah, out of a space, up a hill, and into another space. And the whole distance was maybe 100 feet. Um, but I had I had the car in reverse and I was idling it backwards. And just the, the speed of the idle gear felt like I was moving like some kind of slipstream. I'm like, it's so fast. <laughs> and then we, we worked our way up the hill and parked the thing. And you know, unloaded it all, and shortly later we found DA asleep on the porch, 
And uh, yeah, it was it was a good day. Mm -hmm. Not our <laughs> not our finest <laughs> moment, but we've had worse. <laughs> mm. <laughs> At least she didn't pee on a dog man that day. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Oh, there is a pretty good wooded area about behind my place. We probably could find one. <laughs> we got we got the Greenway Trail right behind there. That's true. We could wander for miles. Wow. <sighs> guys. So gargoyles. <laughs> Philip Croyle's comment. Can you put that up there, please? What are you guys you can can do that? Who's Philip Croyle? It's a dated 0854. I got it. There you go. <laughs> That's it right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God bless you, sir. You you captured the spirit of the moment immediately. <laughs> Ours not in gear, but it's floored. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just love this hysterical though. Yeah. That's amazing. I just watched uh, one of those YouTube shorts of a cop had pulled a lady over and she floored it. You know, he's standing there about to hand her a ticket and off she goes and he jumps in his car and there's a long chase. And he, he suddenly the traffic is stopped and he knows what it means. It means that she's actually been in a wreck. And he gets up there and the back half of her car is stuck up underneath the back end of a semi-trailer. And she's in the front half of her car at the other end of the trailer. And, you know, they're telling her, sit still, put your head on this, don't move, don't try to get out. And she said, well, can I call my sister to come get my car? And I said, you don't even have back tires. You don't even have a back seat. And she said, who did that? And he said, who do you think? She said, it wasn't me, I wasn't driving. He said, you're the only one in the car. I hope she's the only one in the car. Oh yeah, God. she went. The other one might have been back underneath the trailer. But I thought, man, you know, there's a time when the lying just has to stop. <laughs> she had passed that moment. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you some stories from talking to people at the side of a road. Yeah. I'm sure Robbie well, could, too. That, that time that we drove up to the to the house from the barbecue uh, porch. Uh, that was literally the only time I've ever got behind the wheel under the influence. Uh, and, uh, you know, had it not been the fact that we were moving the car 50 feet, I probably wouldn't have. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I lost my best friend to a drunk driver my senior year of high school. And as much as I drink, I don't ever get behind the wheel. And, you know, fortunately, yeah. my wife's on the same page I'm <laughs> on. So we established before we go out who's going to drink that night. And the one that, that doesn't, drives i when i, I say that. that my personality is not conducive to alcohol i'm not kidding i i am that person who i'm sloppy drunk i best friends with everybody i proposition everything i am not a good person to be drunk it's ugly it's horrifying it's humiliating later and um so I have a tendency when I would go out with my friends and I used to love to go out on Friday night and dance and we'd all go out together and everybody would always have their drinks and I know what I'm like, so I don't drink, but I, we'd go to regular different places and the bartenders always knew to make a soda water with lime in it to make it look like I was drinking something. And I would increasingly pretend to, to be inebriated with my friends and a much more, controlled manner than if I was that sloppy drunk person that I know I will would be if I drank. Right. And then at the end of the night, when we all had to go home, they would be amazed at how I was such a great driver sober or drunk. And I was like, yeah, I'm the best driver in the world drunk because I'm dead sober. Well, <laughs> but they always worried that I'd get pulled up and get a DUI, but I never drank because I am that person. Yeah, and there's there and no disrespect to that. There's got to be. <laughs> yeah, I it's I mean it's just being self aware. It's the same reason I don't own a gun. If I owned a gun, I would shoot you. You well, you know I'd feel bad about it. Your family would hate me, and and I'd have to apologize, and I'd go to jail. But you'd still be dead. So well, I don't own a gun. Sure, you got. And she must not like you at all, Steve. No, and, I'm talking about all three of you. <laughs> well, I probably and, uh, got it coming. <laughs> you know, you got to know your limitations and you got to know uh, who 
who your go-tos are if you exceed that limitations. You know, yeah. I've got a handful of names on my phone that will be my person when I need a person. And, yeah. uh, you know, thankfully, DA's not gotten that call at 2 in the morning, uh, you know, going, uh, yep, I need you to go find me. Yeah. E.D. Testament says, I'm listening to all this criminal activity from y'all. I've never done anything like that. I have a halo. You are a Marine, <laughs> so don't even tell me that. <laughs> Lying bastard. <laughs> Yeah. But anyway, gargoyles. I'm sorry. I That's okay. Got, got us off on a we got side we got sidetracked. We it happens. Yeah. I mean anybody anybody that's listened to more than one episode already knows it's gonna happen. Yeah. It's a regular feature of this show. Yeah, pretty much. I think I've seen two, maybe three shows where it didn't happen, so Well, let me let me post Those this probably weren't issue. intentional. No. Since I would say you're probably the closest thing to an expert we have on gargoyles at this point, Ms. Naoma. Mm -hmm. which do you think they are? Are you throwing your money down on the side of they're demonic or that they're protectors? I think that the stone gargoyle was meant to be a protector. I think that's what they were put on the buildings for. I think, well, I mean, obviously, when you think about what they're meant to do is to deflect the water off the building. They're protecting the building. So I can see that. These things flying around, I personally believe whether... They are their own entity, or they've inhabited a piece of stone. I, I personally believe that they're demonic. I was afraid you're going to say that. Sorry, that's where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was I was leaning that way and getting a little 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 bit of an uncomfortable feeling in the base of my skull. And yeah. like, okay, we're we're going to ask the folklore <laughs> expert here. Yeah, I, I was afraid you're going to say that. That's where my mind was going to. And so I don't know that's from Houston my. My was Catholic upbringing or what? The Houston? Was it, that was it the Houston sighting where the guy said he felt like not only did it know he noticed it, but mm -hmm. it seemed like it enjoyed the fact that he was afraid? Yes. Ugh. Frank Shaw, who was the guy who was at the Space Center, he when he talked about it later, he said not only did when he looked up and he, he, he was looking at it, he realized that it had now zeroed in on him. And it, he was feeling an intense amount of fear. And he said, absolutely. He was certain that it knew it, he was looking at it and it was enjoying it. It was it was feeding off of his fear. Only a demon would do that. Yeah, that, Only that's something not something would, a good, a good creature would do. No, no, that's a lot of negative energy right there. Well, there's a subclass of demons that even feed on that kind of stuff. Um, for the life of me, I can't remember what they're called. My demonology is not the best, but uh, there, there's a subclass that basically they, they feed on they feed on negative emotions, you know, fear mm -hmm. and, and the like. Um, you know, it's kind of like the, uh, the the old saying that you know using the name of the thing strengthens the thing. You know, yeah, the same kind of principle. There is actually a demon that if you say its name out loud, you will every time its name said out loud, it strengthens it a little bit. It, a, a specific demon. Um, I don't know if it's. I don't know which. The only one. The only demon whose name I know for sure is Astaroth. 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 I can't even say his name. Um, and I've already just said it two and a half times. So fingers crossed it wasn't that one. <laughs> well, hopefully you didn't pronounce it correctly either time. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've got a, a very good friend. I need to get him on the podcast one of these times because he's a he's a brilliant dude. He's uh, be all kinds of fun. I don't think he's even able to be on here live because he works weekends. Um, he uh, he's not a practitioner of demonology, but he's a practitioner of, of how I guess you call it the occult, but not like creepy the occult. And he was explaining to me the other day about the whole hierarchy of you know the quote unquote Church of Hell because mm -hmm. I guess he has lots of friends in that category. It was like. You know, I was learning these these demon names and and you know how, where they fit everything, and then going back to the Bible where they've showed up there and stuff like that. I'm like, it's actually it, there's enough data there that it's it's scary as hell when you start to think about it. No pun intended. Well, Astroth, uh, you know. Astroth is actually a duke. He's one of the dukes. Of the, I think there's four dukes in hell, yeah, and he's one dukes of them. Princes and yeah. and he is angry. His his his. I don't know, his gripe, is that he felt he was unjustly cast into hell, and that's why he um, he's angry that he's there, because he felt like he didn't deserve to be there. 
And um, the only reason I know him is because I had written a couple of short stories for my channel called The Pit. And um, the character, I would, they based the characters on gargoyles and demons, basically, because that <laughs> I'm twisted and that's fun. But um, the, uh, the, the demon that the bad guys worship that they called forth out of hell happened to be Astroth and his legion. And of course, each of the four Dukes has a legion and all of that. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, KC Calloway says, what's the distinction between a gargoyle and an elemental? Well, um, a gargoyle, I believe if we go with my theory that, you know, it's demonic and has inhabited the stone, it's two things. It's something that has taken over stone. An elemental is actually, so if a person dies and, and they become a ghost, it's the ghost of the person. It's a ghost of a living thing, whether it's a human being or an animal or whatever. An elemental is actually more the spirit of, of the elements. It, it comes from it's not, it was not a living thing to begin with, but it's a spirit that comes from those elements. Does that make sense? It's place too, right? It's the energy, right. It's an energy that built out of whatever the elements are in that particular place. And that's what makes it elemental. Uh, so uh, old green eyes, I think old green eyes is an elemental. A lot of people will argue that and there's a lot of different um theories but i personally think of old green eyes as an elemental that came out of the earth that surrounded um chickamauga 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 or chickamauga whatever it is um that whole area that actually the word chickamauga means river of death that had a bad energy long before even the Cherokee came there and they came there because they were basically trying to get away from the Europeans that had um, already occupied where they were at. They moved their entire, they, they wound up building 10 what you call cities in that area. And then of course the white people kept moving or the Europeans, I shouldn't say white people, the Europeans kept moving in and pushed them further away and then when the battle happened in, um, by the time the battle happened during the Civil War, the the negative energy was already there. It had already been there. The Indian, the Native Americans at that time were already well aware that there was a negative energy there that came from the earth, from the stones and the and the soil, and and that is what an elemental is, as opposed to. It's it's sort of like. If you have the, you know, you have the living things and the, the natural things, living things have souls, natural things become elementals. Makes sense. I've often wondered See, I kind of feel the same way. I feel the same way about um, the, whatever is going on at Skinwalker Ranch, you know, it, it, with, with the metal and everything there. I, uh, we've heard assume it's not extraterrestrial of origin my thought leans towards things like uh like elementals you know, elementals of of the the metal that's found in the soil there and whatnot um, my, I, think you've, you've I think that i think that you're partially right there my theory on on skinwalker ranch is every now and then you get a bunch of people together and this guy has a potato and that one has a carrot and the other guy has some meat and someone else has some some broth and they throw it into a stew pot and you come up with a really amazing soup well i think that this there's cryptids there's ufos there's elementals there's spirits they threw them all into the spot and you or into the pot and you've got one crazy soup going on there i i think mm -hmm. that um I well, think all the Native American we, gods there too, right, right, and and I am and you have Native American uh, negative magic practices going on there, and so I mean, supposedly cursed by the Navajo because of what was done to them uh, by the um, Ute by the Ute tribe. Yeah, I mean, I I'm a Christian. I fully believe in in the Native American gods or whatever whatever. 
whatever you know the wolf and the and the crow and all the 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 eagle and you know, whatever i'm probably using the wrong terminology but hopefully somebody understands what i'm saying how would you say their pantheon yeah thank you thank you that's perfect the and and i think that that's what happens is a lot of times when you deal with the the subjects that we all are fascinated by is too many times we try to find one answer and i think a lot of times it's when when different things collide that it's the strongest and i think that's what's going on i, I think that if we stood here and scratched our heads it's like the missing 411 if we tried to pin everything on cryptids or pin everything on aliens or pin everything on whatever we're never going to have a complete puzzle but if we look at what's going on and say well this one's just a little bit different maybe this is what it is or this one didn't have that so maybe i think that we would be able to put together a much better puzzle where the missing 411 are concerned but that's just me you know i've i've never been the kind of person who accepts one answer is is the rule I agree. I much like in the, the the case at Chickamauga, I uh, I think that there's more than one thing at work. Uh, I don't I don't think it's any one. And and again with the missing four one one, just like you brought up, I think that there are a number of answers. I don't think there's any one simple answer for a lot of these mysteries. I think. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to what my the creepiest story I have ever heard about Chickamauga and. If you want somebody who will talk to you for hours about that particular topic, you need to get my son on the show. He loves that that topic. That is his. Have to do that. Yeah, because that is definitely his wheelhouse. But the Dang, creepiest like challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> the creepiest story I have ever heard about that particular um, uh, legend involved a group of young people you know teenagers young adults whatever they're sitting around a campfire just outside of the actual park but they're along the river there and within definitely within the range of um of where green eyes is seen and one of them happens to look into the woods and they basically see a pair of green eyes slowly materialize slowly become bright green at which point, of course, everybody turns and looks at these eyes and they all felt like they were just like so focused on the eyes that they almost fell into a trance and were unable to, you know, even move or communicate with each other. And everything sort of went foggy for them. And then when they came out of it, one member of the group was gone. And to this oh day, he's a missing person. Now, would an elemental do that? would um would a, a bigfoot have the ability to push that kind of infrasound around and, and pull somebody would i mean I, I there's so many things that could have done that and then when you compare that to the the stories from what was happening on the battlefield when you had you know uh Again, Mothin is the one. After every battle, there's a an after report. You know, anything the military does, once they're done, they have to write a report about it. Because yeah. God after forbid we shouldn't have paperwork. And um, even at that time, there were people who were uh, um, who were talking about um, in their reports, they're saying, you know, their men were seeing this on the battlefield. They were seeing this creature move among the people and, and even like zeroing in on dead bodies and, and, you know, I don't know if carrying them off or whatever, because my son isn't here to help me out, but, uh, or he is, but he's in chat. But um, that is so different from the people going into a trance I mean, that thing was able to make others not see what it was doing. This was seen by many people doing something that didn't make sense. Um, oh, and the other thing is, yeah, the tigers on the battlefield um, and a strange be being hovering over the bodies. These are very, very different from that one encounter. So clearly you're right. Old Green Eyes has to be 
a myriad of things. It can't be just one okay. thing because none of the, you can't pin it down and 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 pick out a specific number of traits without eliminating other traits. Oh. Well, I think one thing we kind of have to bear in mind too. I know, you know, I know a good proportion of our of our chat are, are Christian, like I am, and 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 then no no slander on them or anybody who's not. You know. If we, if you follow the whole idea of Christianity that God is this 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 great architect of everything, this creator of all, it's really self centered of us to assume that we're the only intelligent thing He created. Right. You know, I. You know, there could be these multi dimensional beings. There could be these these supernatural beings. We, we you know, we, you know, our our whole perception of the universe is very, very, very thin. <laughs> right, and, and uh, you know, the, <coughs> you can have both. Bless you. And as Christians, we only know what happened from the Garden of Eden to what's going to happen after um, the thousand year reign. But who's to say, you know, if you look at the numbers in the Bible, all the numbers have specific meaning. Uh, the number seven is, is the number of God. The number eight is the number of a new beginning. Who's to say that this isn't just a segment of time that followed a different segment of time that we weren't told about that's going to to lead into another segment of time that we don't know about. And I mean, because God can do all of this and you're absolutely correct. We are very, very egotistical to say that we're all that mattered or, or all he ever created because oh, clearly. Right. right. I've been going down a rabbit hole with a, another YouTube uh, content creator. And this individual has a focus on the whole younger Dryas period, basically the, the part that happened after the last ice age, but before like the typical post-creation, you know, time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the dude does his research and, you know, if you look at, at the, like the story of the flood, it fits perfectly with this younger Dryas narrative. And, uh, you know, it'd be a perfect opportunity to kind of reboot into this, you know, just new period of history. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it, and the funny thing about it is you can still be a Christian and you can still listen to this and still accept the fact that they were human-like beings 100,000 years ago. You know, when you start doing the math and the creation, you know, from the Bible has to be like six, 7,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what was before that? You know, uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're just, uh, you know, civilization 5.0 or whatever, you know. And, uh, and the same thing with, with extraterrestrial life, you know, the universe has what billions of stars, potentially, you know, hundreds of billions of planets. Did we really start right. life on one of them <laughs> and only one? And isn't there a, a little, um, a, uh, whatever, a spot right now, uh, that's forming, that's kicking out new stars and planets like crazy, mm -hmm. uh, that they just recently discovered. So yeah. You know, yeah, they're called a stellar nursery. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, probably it's not that recent, but well, um, from, from it's recent, the light has recently gotten to us. <laughs> yeah. So, from our point of view, yes. So, yeah, I think that um, I, I agree with you. It's, it's certainly conceivable. And it's one of when I get into th um, theological, couldn't come up with the word for a second. Uh, you know, uh, conversations because half the men in my family are ministers. Uh, these are the fun things that we love to talk about because you don't have to, as you're not denying God and you're not, you know, you're not denying your Christianity by speculating on this and offering suggestions for, to explain a lot of the things that clearly God didn't want us to know, or he'd have already laid it out for us. But, you know, I think I God has a really great sense of humor. I mean, every time I look in the mirror, I'm certain of it. But he has between a, my nose and the platypus, I'm convinced. Is, <laughs> is, uh, you know. I think the platypus is guarantee that God just. It, I mean, at this risk of sounding really, really, really bad, I think God invented marijuana and the platypus on the same day. I was thinking the exact same thing we were thinking. I, I was like, I, I, I didn't want to say because I felt it'd be kind of sacrilegious, but I was like, okay, yeah. now put a duck bill on it exactly. and give it fur. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> it needs poison. Give it poison. 
You know? <laughs> exactly. You know he was like, okay, this is a cool plant. What are we going to do now? <laughs> Light it up and create things. <laughs> oh, it's so egotistical of us to think that we are the, the end all beat all of it yeah. too. You know, uh, with our fragile little human bodies who, who you know, <laughs> who, who, you'll barely make it a hundred years if we're lucky. You know, I yeah. Love it. Love Absolutely. It. So, yeah, that really took us way down the road away well, from. It's kind of related though. I'm, I'm still, I don't know, I'm really bugging about what the, what the significance of these gargoyle creatures are. I mean, I'm totally okay with accepting their demons. You know, with my faith, I believe there's there be demons and all kinds of things. I what have used to they serve other than scaring the shit out of us. <laughs> well, so sticking with the Christian theme, I'm going to discuss things that I don't normally do because uh, I'm not much of a one to have too much of a fight, but let's go for it. Let's what the hell? Well, maybe somebody, me, these, are, these are not right. the opinions of the channel. We're just trying right. To, this is just, we're... these are just things I'm throwing out there. Okay. Right. Um, over time, the Bible told us that it would be the same in the end times as it was in the days of Noah, which makes me think, first of all, that Noah wasn't walking around in, in a white robe. He was probably, you know, and, and you know, carrying a stick and, and cooking over an open fire. He was probably cooking in a, you know, a really nice Viking oven, <laughs> you know, because I think that if it was the same in the end times as it was in the days of Noah and look and assuming that we're at least close to the end times, if not in the end times, it would have had to have been pretty advanced back then. But of course the flood comes and all of that goes away and we had to start from scratch. So I think first and foremost to assume that the antediluvian world was as primitive as, as, as we pretend it was is, is a fallacy to begin with. But I also think that from that point forward, there was a cleanliness because it would clean the earth. And let's face it, every, I think almost virtually every religion has a flood story. So we can assume that the flood was universal. Yeah, all the way back um, to the Epic of Gilgamesh. I mean, yeah, it, it, absolutely. So I think there was a cleanliness in the earth. And I think that one of Noah's daughters in law, carried with her the genes of the Nephilim and and that so the earth wasn't completely clean maybe even all of the daughters-in-law or maybe even his wife because I don't think that the wife that Noah had that he brought with him was the mother of his three sons and that's because I just can't fathom thinking what one of the sons would have done but neither here nor there another story altogether but we move through time and as we move through time Satan being who we see Satan as being, if you're a Christian who believes in Satan, and I know that there are a lot of Christians who don't, but I do, has tried to slowly overtake the earth. And the only way he can do this is to increasingly create more evil. Mm -hmm. And the only way he can do this is to unleash his demons and let them multiply and unleash his demons and let them multiply. I think that's why dogmen come from the earth and from, from the caves. I think dogmen are about as demonic as it gets. And I think that's why they come from within the earth. And I think over time, I think that's why we're seeing more paranormal activity now than we've ever seen in history. I think that's why we're seeing things that don't make sense to most people because even though they may have been around forever, they started out as maybe one and then they became 10 and then became a hundred and now they're a million. Right. And I think that what we're seeing, uh, going to Puerto Rico, since 2020, there have just been this flood of, of gargoyle sightings. This isn't a place where that happened a lot before. I mean, it probably did, but we're talking Every time you turn around, there was a lady who was headed out to her farm with her kids. She gets out to open the gate. She sees this thing sitting down in the field. She's like, well, that's a weird looking bird. 
when her son later goes out to take out the garbage, he comes back. He's like, that wasn't a bird, mom. That thing's scary looking. And they look outside and there it is, this huge gargoyle thing. It gets on the roof of their house and it, it, it walks back what? and forth and it terrifies this family. It goes on and on and on. There was another couple who, uh, I feel like I'm dominating. If you guys want me to shut fine. up. For well, you're, you're the expert now, but please do. <laughs> um, but, you know, there was another couple that for months they kept seeing this thing and they kept seeing this thing. All of a sudden they wake up one night and it's walking around on the roof and it's terrifying. And, and I think that that's what we're having. We're having like almost like a blooming of evil and of evil things. And that will continue until... You know, oh, yeah. I mean, and that's it. I mean, even if you look at just, if you even take away the paranormal and the cryptids and just paranormal, anything not normal, and just look at what's going on with mankind as a, as a whole, we have become, I mean, we've... We've become the, the crap that comes out of the butthole of, of the world right now. Humanity is no longer uh, a part of the world. We have literally become the the, the waste. Mm -hmm. And we are getting in increasingly worse. And I'm just, um, <sighs> you know, I'm sorry. I just got distracted by a comment. Should not do that. Um, but... It just seems to me like there's a blooming of evil. And I believe that the gargoyles that we're seeing are a product of that bloom. Um, you know, they're the flowers that are coming out of that garden. Well, another thing to consider, too, is, is uh, you know, there's an old saying about history is written by the victors. You know, mm -hmm. to an extent, that's true with any history and not necessarily victors, but it's, it's history always has a slant. And I was thinking, so, somebody had been coming in the chat earlier, and forgive me, I don't have the ability to highlight a chat and bring it out. I don't remember who it was. But um, somebody asked about, you know, the descendants of Cain or whatever. And uh, so, you know, if you look at the Bible, you know, you had Cain and Abel. Obviously, Cain slayed Abel, so Abel never got a chance to really reproduce as far as we know. Well, Cain went on and did his thing. But all the rest of humanity descends from Seth, son number right. three, who took Abel's place. And mm -hmm. all of our history is written by Seth's lineage. Right. What do Cain's people do? <laughs> well, Where I mean, Cain's... They, you know, and exactly. I'm not saying that, that Cain's people are necessarily demonic or whatever else, but that's a, you know, theoretically 50% of history is missing. Well, yeah, absolutely because it is. At that point, it's it's kind of like the stereotypical, well, that. you did really bad, you're dead to me. What was that, DA? I'm sorry. I said probably more than that. Well, absolutely, because not only do we have the missing part of history, but we have the part of history that was written, and then somebody came along and said, well, I don't like the way that was written. Let's change it. And we don't have the part that, that started. Um, oh, thanks, Judy. Uh, where it started, um, because we don't have the, you know, the somebody changed it. Oh, God, what is the library that was destroyed? Library of Alexandria. Yes. Alexandria's library. Imagine what we lost in that library. Just imagine. It's heartbreaking. Oh, yeah. It was, it made the Library of Congress look like a book of cliff notes. I mean, it was, it was, it was it. It was, it was the collective knowledge of civilizations. Oh, my God. Yeah. If I had a, I don't know, a, if for, you know, I'm showing my inner geek here, but if I had like a TARDIS and I could go back to any point in history and I could understand any language. I would set my ass down in the Library of Congress and hang out there for months. Yeah. Congress or Library of Alexandria? I'm sorry. Alexander. I know what you mean. Thank you. God bless. Well, Library of Alexandria and just sit there for months and read anything I can get a hold of. Um, you know, God, I can't even imagine what was there. And, you know, we, we always assume that these these faster than, you know, realistic craft and, and whatever are, are all extraterrestrial. You know, what if it's people that still had the books? <laughs> yeah. Well, so the Atlanteans or whatever, you know, I also wanted to point out, this is a little going off a little bit, but if you study names in the Bible, they all have meanings they, I mean, you know, there's this reason why Seth was named Seth because it means new beginning, um, a, a restart, a reboot. <laughs> um, and if you look at the names of Cain and Abel, 
according to the ancients what they meant, not what we what we take them to mean today. But if you look at the ancients and go back and really study that, you will realize that of the two brothers, Cain was the bro better brother. He was the harder worker. He was the more upright man. He only did one thing wrong. And that is when God said, this is what I need my sacrifice to be. Cain said, yeah, but I'm a gardener and I got all these great vegetables. So I'm going to give you that instead. God said, no, I want it to be a lamb. And Abel was the shepherd. So he brought his best fruits, which was the lamb. So he did the right thing. That's what started it all. Cain disobeyed God, but he wasn't a bad guy. He wasn't, he, in fact, by all accounts, if you just look at the names, he was most likely the better of the two. And I just wanted to point that out because I always get frustrated when people are like, Cain was a bad guy. Well, no, he was a person pushed to, to, to the point of frustration that he did something evil. And the biggest mistake we make in the 21st century is assigning pure evil and pure good to everything. And there's no such thing. I agree. So, yep, there you go. <sighs> you lost okay. Steve. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so, yeah, I lost my chatting partner. <laughs> I've been listening to every word. Unfortunately, I had to step away for a second to deal with something. Uh, you know, it, it is interesting you, you you touched on that just because of, uh, I was thinking, and forgive me, my theology is not as good as, as probably somebody in the chat. Uh, if I remember correctly, Moses never got to step into the promised land. Right. And when you go back and read either Exodus or Genesis, wherever it's mentioned, all of it boils down to the fact that he had told him to touch the rock and the water would come out, but he smacked the rock and the water would come mm -hmm. out. And I'm sitting there thinking about the fact that the God portrayed there, you know, it didn't take a whole lot to get on the bad side of things. No. You know, thankfully the new Testament came along, but I was sitting there thinking about, well, that. I was about like, yeah. say, what, what, what y'all talking about was all the, you know, the old Testament stuff, which was a totally different time. When Jesus came along, he rectified that gap between man and God. Right. right. He toward he he, he physically bridged, yeah, he bridged he he took the brunt of every sin before and after. So yes, God was a vengeful, wrathful God in the old testament because of the way things were. But that's not the he didn't choose to be that way. It was just the the, the nature of man caused him to have to act that or act on that well, if you look at the the old temple, there was it's broken into sections. You have the the outer court, the inner court, the holies, and the holiest of holies. And between the holies and the holiest of holies is the the it was a big cloth, the veil. The veil. And excuse me, excuse me again. And when prior to the crucifixion of Christ, you had to be a rabbi to step beyond that. You could not enter. There, there was you had to be holiest of holies to get inside right. that inner that not last. Only a rabbi, but a Levite on top of it all. It, right, and a Levite. Yeah, absolutely correct. When at the moment of crucifixion, when at the moment that Jesus gave up the the spirit, that veil was rented. It was torn in two, and it opened the uh, the holies uh, holy of holies to all of us right. and and so symbolically and physically he be he allowed for that uh, and i 100 percent agree with that no um, he did not cause man to be that he gave man free will man chose the path that he walked down the other thing that we have to always remember is um is Ask, ask yourself, when did Adam and Eve, um, when did they sin? Did they sin when they ate, when Eve ate the apple and, or the, the fruit? I have moments when I think that Satan looks at that apple and thinks apple pie, apple strudel, <laughs> apple butter, so many things I could have done with that apple. But you know, he looks around and sees who's going to be in hell with them. I would feel that way. But um, he um, did that. Was that? No, 
that was when they became aware of sin. They'd been doing that stuff all along. They just did that's they didn't eat from the tree of good of good and evil. They ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to understand is that it's the knowledge that changes things. Well, I, I think the sin in itself was the fact that he told them not to, and they didn't listen. It wasn't the fact that they. No, I, I, I know what that sin was. Yeah. What I'm suggesting is that that wasn't the first sin. It's the first one we know about. And in all honesty, if you look at that, um, Eve added things. <laughs> I mean, you know, God said, don't do this, because if you do, you know, it's bad things are going to happen. But Eve said, well, if we do, we're going to die. <laughs> And then she took a bite out of it and didn't die because she added things. She 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 took God's interpretation, what God said, and she put her own interpretation on it, and that's where we get into trouble. But and I don't mean to get make this such a, a whole thing on theology. I really didn't mean to do that, but um, I do think that when they bit into the fruit, and I personally like to think it's a pomegranate because I've never met a fruit harder to get into. <laughs> 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 it's so good when you do but um when they bit into the fruit uh i think they became aware of what mm -hmm. they were yeah, not well, it, that's what the, the devil said when you when you eat it you're gonna know what he what god knows that right. that was the that was the the whole yeah, that's what he was telling sales, them that was his sales pitch right and they were so, like well that's not fair for him to know things that we don't yeah let's yeah. go ahead and eat into it and yeah. eve telling you know she told adam well god said surely we would die instantly i've taken a bite of this and i'm still here god's lied to us because she twisted it too it was a big yeah. sales pitch and a lot of adding of things that weren't there and i really don't um I, I, I really feel like I'm going to get a lot of ugly emails for this because I know what the sin was. I get that the sin was disobedience. I get that the sin that caused them the downfall of man happened in this clearly at that moment. All I'm saying is it wasn't necessarily, that wasn't necessarily their first sin it was the sin that allowed them to acknowledge that everything they were doing was a sin. You know, mm -hmm. prior to that, they were all walking around and, you know. So I got a, got a question for you, kind of regarding where we started with the show here, uh, Naoma. Mm -hmm. Now, the only place I've ever seen gargoyles before was on churches. Mm -hmm. Do they exist anywhere else? Mm -hmm. I literally don't know. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't um, know that a grotesque a of, and a gargoyle were two different things until tonight. Yeah, um, I actually prefer a grotesque over a gargoyle because gargoyles tend to only be the heads, and a lot of times a gargoyle goyle may be a frog, or I mean, you know, the grotesque is the thing that looks like what we think a gargoyle looks like. But um, they appeared on castles and uh, forts and all kinds of places throughout history because a gargoyle specifically because they were a really good system of drawing water away from a roof of a building that would otherwise struggle under that, you know. Under the water, right. Right, you know. So what is the grotesque purpose then, other than to scare people passing by? Grotesques are decorations, and, and okay, they are. just decorations. Yeah, they're just okay. a decoration, whereas a gargoyle has a purpose, so. I got you. So the, the architect got into some bad mushrooms and... Yeah, the mm -hmm. grotesque is part of his uh, his, his, yeah. his design. Okay. I, th I think probably what, I mean, you know, to get really tacky about it, he probably put that spout out there and thought, well, <laughs> that looks obscene. Let's cover it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the buildings you see with phallic things on the architecture. Yeah. Like, what was the purpose of that? Exactly. We need to do something about that because that does not look right to me. One of my favorite stories that uh, David Brenner, the comedian, used to tell, he grew up in Philadelphia, and he always talked about the statue of William Penn being there, and, and William Penn standing there with a scroll in his hand, and it's kind of down at his side, and he said, when it would rain heavy, and the water would run down that scroll. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so, yeah, I'm sure that had a lot to do with with uh, why they wanted. Um, I, you know, it's interesting because in 1880, the same time, about the same time that the gargoyle was appearing in Louisville, there was also a spate of gargoyle, gargoyle sightings in New Jersey and New York City. And so I'm guessing there must be a lot of buildings in New York that have gargoyles on them. Sure. From an architectural standpoint, I'm trying to figure out like where the gargoyles fit in. Obviously, they're in the times of the cathedrals, you know, you know, 1400, 1500, you know, 80 and stuff like that. You don't see real modern buildings that still have them. When did they kind of go out of fashion? And I wonder why they went out of fashion. You know, what changed there? Is that you know, post-industrial revolution when we became a little more secular or, or is is there something else to it? Well, I maybe I, I'm I'm not I'm by no means an engineer, God help me. Um, but I would imagine that having the water run off the top of the building through a spout sends it out, but the wind could still draw it back. And not only the roof of the building needs to be protected from the water, but the foundation really needs to be protected. So probably somebody came up with the idea of making that downspout and then putting a type outward and Basically therefore gutters destroyed the gargoyle. Yeah, gutters destroyed. Yeah, put them right. I love in the it. Okay, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I mean that would that that's speculation on my, my part. I'm not an engineer. I I couldn't tell you. I you know, but Makes that sense. would I mean, be what before guttering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, you know. I mean, the guttering on your house is basically just a modern day extension of what of those old gargoyle. gargoyles originally served. They were to get water away from the edge of your buildings. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that is more efficient, having it run down a downspout and then out rather you can than having to control it far out. more than just shooting it out of the air. And you can have a New down. Jersey devil a gargoyle. Um, I. God, I love the story of Mother Leeds and her 13th child. I, I can't answer that. If, if a gargoyle is a demon, I think that the Jersey Devil is demonic. Um, so my answer would be yes. But Solid maybe. A solid I maybe. Remember, I, I mean, if you ask Mother Leeds... What's that? You know, I'm trying to think of all the sightings of the Jersey Devil. Like, if you think about the Mothman, the Mothman always surfaced right before some kind of disaster. You know, mm -hmm. that, that bridge failure and, and whatever. Not, I forgot the name of the bridge. Forgive me, guys. Um, Silver but Bridge. But, like, the Jersey Devil. Silver Bridge. Thank you, Dave. Uh, the Jersey Devil. I mean, what refresh my memory. What, what, were the, what were the circumstances of its most famous sightings? I only know the origin. I don't really, there's, I can't name. There's no rhyme or reason to, to their sightings. They're just, we just did a show on it. Uh, okay. So I wasn't missing I, something I, then because I couldn't yeah, recall it's just, any. It's just, and there's so many different descriptions of what it looks like. There's, there's no one, you know, like Bigfoot is, even though there's different names, different sizes, different, few things there it's still pretty much the same thing the jersey devil has like 12 different descriptions right. some people say it has a head of a horse and some people say it's the head of a goat some people say it's the head of a dog or um there's all kinds of different descriptions about the body some say with wings some say without some say bipedal some say quadruped i mean it's just it's all over the shop with what it is so you know going back to what we said earlier if it is a demon and it is possessing something else and it's just it's just taking over whatever is available and actually uh johnny and i kind of uh speculated on this that it some of the descriptions kind of sound like wendigos so i think there might be some correlation with because a lot of them talk about horns uh mm -hmm. sunken skeletal type faces like maybe the head of a moose or an elk or a deer or something like that. I think there's some correlation with that. Yeah. A lot of people well, don't realize the, how big the pine barrens are too. There's like sure. a million square acres. One million acres. And it's got oh. a 17 million gallon aquifer. Wow. 
Well, think about how close the uh, the territory of the Jersey Devil is to New York as well. You know, well, it's and or geographically, it's not that far away. The Jersey Devil is the only cryptid that I know of that I could find that's actually got a professional sports team named after it. Tell me another <laughs> professional sports team that's got a, a cryptid as their mascot. That's a deal. We need to found the Springfield Wendigos. There you go. Um, there is a skin condition, Steve. Harlequin. Um, oh, what? It, Harlequin. I know it's got Harlequin in the name. Um, I'm looking it up. I was hoping that you'd be like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what that is. Um, you overestimate my capabilities, ma'am. Uh, you're, you're medical. Harlequin ichthyosis. Are you familiar with that? Not off the top of my head. Give me a quick second. I could get there, though. Um, forgive me. I don't know if it'll show. Probably not. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. I am familiar with it. I wasn't familiar with the term, but yeah, I am familiar with it. I'm probably saying it wrong. That's why. Yeah, I, I think the, yeah you said it correctly. I wonder if Mother Leeds Baby wasn't born with that. Because you know the devil baby of New Orleans, right. um, a, a Bourbon Street uh, that's tied in with Marie Laveau and uh, um, Madam, um, oh God, this lady serial killer in New Orleans. Um, anyway, that particular baby, there, there's a lot of speculation that that child simply had Harlequin, Harlequin ichthyosis. And I wonder if that's what Mother Leeds' baby had too. Right. I've actually seen a case of this. It's not very common uh, for, for the rest of the chat here. Harlequin ichthyosis, it's a genetic thing, and it's a skin disorder. Uh, some of you might be familiar with um, fertiligo, uh, kind of like uh, uh, Michael Jackson suffered from. You know, you'll see patches of the skin that aren't the normal pigmentation and like very white and, and just stand out and, and, and are very abnormal looking. Okay, think of that, but instead of white patches, think a very hard, thick skin that looks kind of like fish scales. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not very common, but basically this, after birth, these, these scaly areas start developing. And, and because of the, the oddity of the whole thing, they, uh, they attribute it to things like the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Dagon followers in the, in the, um, uh, oh, what is his name? I just drew a complete blank. Uh, God bless. Help me, DA. The uh, the one that wrote about Cthulhu and and Lovecraft. Lovecraft. Uh, in, in the Lovecraft, Lovecraft stories, um, uh, it's you know it it all kind of ties in, and you know any any of these things, there's always some kind of abnormality or or demonology or something attached to it. You know, chances are, I mean, if if you went far enough back into to you know. Victorian times and further back into you know the like the times of the Crusades that ever, you know they probably interpret some of the Down syndrome as being some kind of weird, you know, mm -hmm. demonic entity. Uh, but yeah, it, it's extremely rare, but you don't see it very often. Um, it's kind of like the werewolf syndrome that you see with the uh, with the uh, the hypertrichosis in certain places, and and you know it yeah, Killer Croc exactly. Josh Vidal does yeah Killer Croc for Batman. Yeah, it, it's along that 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 line of reasoning. Uh, yeah, it's it's all it's all connected. By the way, in answer to Deborah's question, yes, um, gargoyles and grotesques, and I did misspeak earlier, were considered uh, something to eat to ward off evil spirits when they were attached to buildings. But a gargoyle's primary function was to deflect water from the building. I saw that come up. But I didn't want to interrupt. Steve I was fascinated by this. <laughs> Well, our biggest problem is our biggest blessing. We have so many people in the chat that sometimes we can't keep up with it. <laughs> yeah, but the so um, I do know that, for instance, the White Bluff Screamer, which is over here by me in Tennessee, it's part of the the White Bluff Screamer and the uh, Werewolf of Werewolf Springs are next door neighbors to each other. They're great legends, but the White Bluff Screamer is. Its origin begins with a child that was hid in a basement because it was probably born um, physically or mentally handicapped in some way. And I think that that was very common. There's a mansion in St. Louis, uh, 
and again, I was hoping you guys in Missouri would jump in and say, "Oh, you, yeah, that mansion, that mansion, L E M P." Is that the one where they the the young boy was supposedly hidden away? Yeah, yeah and his and probably his only sin was that he was born with a some form of of being deformed or or handicapped. Well, so I Gaston think that Rose, Phantom of the Opera, same thing. Yeah, there you go. So I think yeah. it happens. I think it did happen a lot in, in historically. I think really only in this last century have we given any um, real human treatment to uh, people with any kind of, uh, of abnormality, for lack of a better word. There was a, a young girl who... Um, she is the reason that Illinois actually rewrote their their laws and standards for mental health because she uh, she believed that she was uh, I did a short on her and of course I can't remember her name gosh darn it this the story goes like this she fell in love with the young boy the young boy's mom did not like her she didn't think her family deserved to be married into their family she thought she was trash the whole nine yards so because you know this woman is such a pillar of society she practiced witchcraft and told the young supposedly and cast a spell on this young girl and the young girl essentially because you know the mind is a powerful weapon believed it and she basically went insane she was taken to uh, basically a poor farm which is you know what we had back then that also doubled as mental asylums at the time and lived out the entire rest of her life in a box. In a box. And, um, but the way she was treated was, well, she's crazy, so we're going to put her in this box so we can control her. Hmm. And when uh, she did eventually, and she wasn't the entire rest of her life, she was eventually taken out of the box. But um, she had lived in there with mice and rats and her own feces. Um, if she got sick, she was in there with her own vomit for decades. Because that's how we treated people like that. Because we saw them as being not just ill, not just deformed, but actually evil. That that was some kind of, of manifestation of evil coming through them. And so I think things like... Um, um, the Jersey Devil and the White Bluff Screamer and, you know, any of the other stuff that we've mentioned here tonight could very well have just been a case of this is how we treated not, I don't think, I, I shouldn't say anything else because I really do think that the gargoyles and demons are an exception, but, you know, the kid, like the, the baby, um, the devil baby of Bourbon Street. Um, Were you talking mother, about Elizabeth Packard? Uh, I can't remember her name. Okay. Because I what remember studying Elizabeth really Packard in nursing sure. school. Um, the one I'm thinking on. of was around 1823, give or take that point. Um, uh, no, this one, she was actually in the 20th century. She, we're, okay. we're talking like 1915. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Um, uh, I'll tell you her name in just a second. I just have to remember how to get to my own channel. Because I did a short her. <laughs> yeah, I know it's terrible. Um, no problems. <laughs> I so I've been sick. I mean, I really truly got very very ill this winter, and um, to the point that I was sleeping sixteen to twenty hours a day. And it's been a bad winter. It's oh, and yeah. I haven't been on, I mean, I haven't put up a story in months. In fact, I'm doing, I just recorded one today that I'm going to try to get up. My boyfriend's mom is such a witch. Rhonda, or Rhoda Derry is her name. Rhoda Derry. Oh, story. Okay. And uh, it's, it's heartbreaking what her story is, but because of her, they actually rewrote all of the laws, at least in Illinois, um, and maybe even in Indiana, because I think she started out in Indiana. Uh, and because that's how we see people, yeah. you know, we see normal is, is a setting on the washing machine, but our nature is 
we're hardwired to look at what is like us right. and group us over here and what isn't and group them over there. Well, it's just the way we. What'd you say, dear? Uncanny Valley. You read my mind. It's sad that we're on the same page. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, it, we're, 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 we're evolutionarily and ecologically bred to be scared of what isn't quite us. Exactly. Something that's almost human. Almost us. <laughs> you know, like, just as an example, I grew up watching Star Trek The Next Generation. I absolutely love Data. He's my favorite Star Trek character ever. But, like, these new human-like robots that come up with these AI robots scare the shit out of me. And I don't know why, <laughs> but they terrify me. You know, the just too too much but not enough i um recently did another story about a woman in arizona who received a phone call from her daughter saying that she'd been kidnapped and i'm sorry mom i've made a big mistake and the woman hearing her daughter's voice called her husband and said something's horribly wrong uh, the woman happened to be at work. She knew her daughter had been on a skiing trip and um, she called her husband at home and said this. And her husband's like, she just walked in the door 10 minutes ago. She's not been kidnapped. Now, this was a news story. I watched this on the news. It, it really did happen. A lot of people who saw it and they were like, oh, no, 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 no. That, that, that was fake. But what they had done is they'd taken the woman's voice. All they needed was, I think it's three seconds to be able to create the girl's voice, not the woman's voice, the girl's voice. And they, they made an EI recording of this girl's voice and that fooled her mother. And had she not just walked in the door, she'd been 10 minutes later, you know, that's how quick an AI scares the living hell out of me. Well, my, my sister-in-law, her father passed away two years ago. Now uh, he lost a battle of pancreatic cancer and uh, on his birthday two days ago, she got a text saying that, um, you know, he's having a great day. I love you, sis, and whatever else. And, you know, it was from his phone number. Now, his phone hasn't existed in years, but it was some kind of weird AI something or other. Mm -hmm. And she's like, not only is this creepy, that it's cruel. It's absolutely yeah. cruel. And, uh, you know, even picked out types of things he would call her. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, horrifyingly cruel yeah yeah that scares the living hell out of me good night mothin kiss that feisty baby for me i don't get to see her much um if you gentlemen um i i don't want to disrupt the show but i'm reaching a point where i've got a leg that's swelling up and i'm going to have to get up and walk around yeah, we're, uh, worries, we're getting ready to wrap things up anyway. So, if you will, uh, I'll go ahead and post the link to your show one more time in well, the chat. You. I've been posting it periodically. Oh, bless your heart. Well, it's always a pleasure uh -huh. to hear your stories, Miss Dama. <laughs> I love, I love, 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 love coming. <coughs> Sorry about that. I love coming on the show and I miss you guys so much. We miss you too. And if I had the energy, I'd be here every week bothering the hell out of you. Well, just but as it, even better. Yeah. Someday I'm going to feel well enough that you won't be able to get rid of me again. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, I miss hanging out with you guys a lot. I miss you too. I even like you, Robbie, and I never got to hang out with you before. <laughs> You know, I got to hang out with him recently when he was at DA's house. And, you know, I kind of yeah. like hanging out with him, too. I think I mean, this, I'm going to try to make it this I will count to taste you, too. What'd you say? I'm sorry. There's no counting to taste you, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never Man. been accused of being a cultured taste. <laughs> <laughs> There's a quote from a movie that, um, I don't know what you is, but whatever you is, use pure 100%. And that's the way I feel about you, Robbie. I don't know what you are, but whatever you are, you are pure one hundred percent. Redneck. Yeah. Lynn Danison says we like having Naomi, even if she laughs at the hoo hoos. <laughs> yeah, you too can be a hoo hoo. <laughs> yeah. I think our collective maturity level is about fourteen. If we're lucky. Right? Yeah. When I come on the show, it probably drops a few more years. <laughs> <laughs> 
we, we don't set the bar very high. I think we're all middle aged and, and we, you know, yeah, yeah, we got problems. We've reached a point where we can have fun again. Don't have to worry about what everyone's thinking about us. Kind of don't know that I ever reached the point where I cared what other people thought about me. You know, I, I was actually nervous about coming on the show tonight because, uh, I, I ended up getting a haircut and they took off more than I planned. And I'm like, Ken Brock's going to be on there and he's going to harass me about my haircut Aww. again. <laughs> well, I thought about. you looked pretty darn good. <laughs> well, they, they, they got a little carried away. Yeah. Did you, just, uh, did you yeah. sweep it up and send it to DA? A little packet of glue. Well, I'm, I'm noticing it's not as thick as it used to be up there. I'm like, I'm not going to be too far from DA here before too much longer. You uh, know, men aren't the only products to buy. Men aren't the only ones. I actually have about my, I mean, I've, if I let my hair dry naturally when I was in my 20s, I had this mount, I looked like Diana Ross on a bad day. And now that I'm in my 50s, I don't have to have it thinned or anything. It just lays fine. So yeah. I know how you feel. I mean, I yeah, really, truly do. I haven't like, thinned my hair in years. And the annoying part of the whole thing is my father's going to be 75 years old this year. And he has a better hairline than I do. My father-in-law just died at 97 and he had the nicest head of hair you ever saw. My husband probably will too. Mm -hmm. The only difference is my husband's hair is longer than mine. Rat <laughs> bastard. Anyway, <laughs> I, I'm going to um, have to call it a night, guys. But I sure do appreciate you having me on the show. Hey, Ms. Bielma, we love you. I love Have you good too. Night. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> good night, guys. I don't. Well, okay, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so, DA, where do you weigh in on this? What do you What do you think? And the gargoyles are do you leading more de demonic or protector in them? I don't know. I really don't. Uh, I think originally they were intended to be protectors, but you know things get corrupted. So I, it's hard to say. I mean. If mm -hmm. you see something that looks like a gargoyle and it terrifies you, it's probably not there to help. Makes sense. What about you, Robbie? I think it's a bit of both. I think because it's like DA said, things get corrupted, things get so. I don't think anything's above that, other than things we talked about earlier. And I think originally that's what people intended that they were supposed to be protectors and i think things got into that and corrupted it's, you know er everything that starts out good can end up being used for evil or and corrupted that way and i just i think that's where we're at now as you get you know just like certain people's dogman stories are just hey it looked like an animal others describe it as demonic does that mean every single one of them are that way no it just means that some of that's happened. Well, like even the Bigfoot thing. I mean, some people attribute Bigfoot to be, you know, some lost relic of humanity. Some contribute it to be Nephilim or, or, you know, Gugway or something scary as hell. I, I, don't think, know. I'm I think I'm kind of on the fence too. I think I'm going to skip the, um, the, uh, Affiliate links tonight and just kind of wrap things up. I'm not feeling so hot. I'm just going to do sorry, the dude. toast and call it a night. And uh, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll uh, see you guys back here on Wednesday night. So, uh, uh, oh, like I said, there's an old song, old Irish drinking song that I like. Uh, it's called, uh, just to a complete blank. Um, the parting glass. The parting it's glass. Called the parting glass. And, um, you know, it, they 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 sing it at the end of the song, when, end of the night when they close the bar. But when you listen to the lyrics, they're really talking about those that we've lost along the way. Uh, so whatever you got, lift a glass, you know, of you know, good cheer, and uh, I'll uh, close out the show. But since it fell into my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be to you all. Good night, everyone. Sludge bye. Thank you for joining us. Catch us again Wednesdays and Saturdays on DAX Machina. 
A special thanks to all our channel members and Patreon supporters. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe.